everybody. Thank you for being with us. I'm Rebecca Hyland and welcome to Groundwork. I am running for the state representative seat of the 90th district, which is a large portion of Wallingford and Middlefield. And I have with me Liz Linehan, state representative for the 103rd House District, and I would like to say thank you so much for giving us this time, especially as campaign season is kicking off. Thank you for having me. This is really fantastic. And you are running again? I am. I'm running for my fourth, ter fourth term. Fourth term. Mm -hmm. I had to think about it. So when did you first uh, become a state representative? Uh -huh. So this is really a funny story, and it, I feel like now um, you're Barbara Walters, <laughs> and I'm opening up on your very first question. Oh. I'm going to tell you some good stuff. But, uh, you know, I'm an open book. Um, I first ran, actually, in 2012, and the way that happened was, I believe it was Connecticut had just legalized um, same-sex marriage, and I wanted to become a justice of the peace. So I Googled. Uh, and I learned how to become a justice of the peace. It's not easy. It can only happen during a presidential election year. You need to be nominated by your party. I mean, it's like, you know, it's not easy. I wouldn't but think I'll, it'd be that complicated. It is. <laughs> so I said, okay, I, you know, I've never talked to my party chair. I'll call him up. And I left a message and I said, this is who I am. You know, this is why I want to do this. Can you please nominate me? So not 10 minutes went by and he called me back and he said, I'm willing to nominate you and um, the convention is tomorrow night. You just got in just under the wire, but we don't have anybody to run for state rep for the 103rd district. So we want to put you in as a placeholder. He's like, don't worry about it. We'll find someone to take your place, no problem. And I, was, and I said, well, okay, you know, whatever I can do to help, right? Naturally. Um, and I thought it was hilarious. I called my husband, who was at work, and I said, you're never going to guess. In order to be, you know, a justice of the peace, they now want me to be a placeholder to run for state rep. Isn't that the funniest thing you have ever heard? And my husband was like dead silence on the other end of the phone. And he said, no, that's not stupid. You were born for this. This is everything you've wanted to do. You just didn't know you wanted to do it yet. And I thought about it, and he was absolutely right. Once I admitted that I uh, was pregnant, the then Speaker of the House, Brendan Sharkey, took away all of the House Dems' help because he thought I couldn't possibly win if I was pregnant. I wouldn't be able to knock doors. Uh, and so he took away all of my help. And that was the impetus for the um, pregnancy protections bill that we passed when I did get elected in 2016. One wow. of the first bills I passed in 2017 was pregnancy protections and accommodations in the workplace. Exactly. I did not know that. Yep. That it, well, thank you for passing that. Hi, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, for breastfeeding moms, you know, and um, for pregnant women. And it was really helpful in that um, it started a conversation where people didn't realize that when you ask for accommodations, it really isn't that difficult to provide them. And I think that there was um, a belief that any time you ask for accommodations, it's going to cost the business money. It means right. time off. It might mean a different chair. It might mean to have your office where you don't have to walk up the stairs. Right. A lot of different things. Um, and so since we passed that, I've heard not only from pregnant women, but also from business owners who are glad that we provided those protections. When you think about it, when you make people happier in their workplace, more they become more productive yeah. and therefore more profitable. Absolutely, 100%. And it's a win-win. But people... When it comes to change, if it's not spelled out for them as to what it's going to look like, right. there's a fear, and, it, and then they think the worst. So um, as you'll find out when you are state representative, when you write legislation that does in fact make change, uh, it's very important to spell out what that change is going to look like and what it's going to mean for someone, whether that is a business, whether that is an individual, your constituent, uh, whomever. It's just important to really say this is the vision. And, you know, I have to tell you, um, your story about <clears throat> how you made the decision to run is very, very similar to mine. You just did it, huh? I, I didn't think I had the chops to run. It was actually back in 2020 when there was not an initial candidate running uh, for the 90th district uh, as a Democrat. 
some people reached out to me and that planted the seed but then Jim Jinx stepped oh, forward my buddy Jimmy yes and he ran a great campaign absolutely lost by seven votes which is why Shocking. every vote counts Every vote, Every vote counts. counts. And as a result of the redistricting, uh, Jim Jenks is not part of the 90th district anymore. And same thing. I, I said to myself, if not now, then when? And it was my husband who said, do it. I said, you need to do this. You, yeah. you, you have a lot of different background experiences and... This is where you can put it all together. The support is so yeah. important, right? I mean, it's not an easy job. I love it when people say, oh, well, it's a part-time job. This is not a part-time job. Well, that's like teachers get summer off. Teachers right, get, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, it's a, it's a part-time <clears throat> legislature, uh, but it certainly is a full-time job. And, and I am um, extremely envious of those who have the skills to be able to do both the legislature uh, and outside employment. Uh, being the fact that I still have little kids, I certainly can't do that. It's a lot of work, and, and so I commend you for being willing to take that on. Thank you, thank you very much. How old are your kids? Nine, 11 next week, wow. and 13. How do you balance raising a family and doing the state legislature job. I don't. <laughs> and that's like a very serious answer. I am asked to speak to women and young women all the time. That's a question I get at almost every uh, sit down that I have. It's how do you balance it? I think it's really important for women and, and men, you know, really anyone, especially a single parent, to hear that it's impossible to always be in balance. There are days when, <clears throat> or rather weeks, when my kids have nuggets and McDonald's and whatever, three, four days in a row, which hurts my soul as a mom, um, but that's because the legislature is taking my time right now. And then there are times when my kids really need me, and then sometimes I have to ask for help in order to get things done on the other side. And so there's never really a time when you're going to be in balance. What you want to do is have the imbalance trade on and off. It's, you know, it's, it's an honest answer, and there's no other way to put it. It's something that uh, I've been struggling a lot with just in terms of getting the campaign underway is mm -hmm. asking for help. Uh, because I've been lucky enough to be at home uh, with Henry, so I haven't had an outside job since uh, the beginning of COVID. And now that I'm essentially working every day, because I'm going out and door knocking, uh, and I can't bring a three-year-old, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, he would just run. <laughs> I'm having to ask for help, and that's it's hard to do. It is hard to do. I think it's hard for every working mom. Yeah. Right? It absolutely is. Um, but at the same time, it's a skill. And asking for help is a muscle that needs to be flexed. If you don't work out that muscle uh, of asking for help, you will forget how to use it and you'll get buried. But the same thing is learning to say no. That's important, That's too. That's true. That you know? is true. Yeah. So learn that. You know. These are excellent advice. Can you go out for drinks? No. I'd love to see you, you dear old friend, but I'm balancing the legislature and I'm balancing my family right now, but eventually I'll be able to call you and, and we'll definitely do something. And, yeah. you know, it just, there's no such thing as true balance. Well, the, the have it all. The, can, yes. yes, the have it all. The have it all, concept. right? That puts so much pressure on people. Oh, so much pressure. So much pressure on young people, too, who... <sighs> are trying to figure out the perfect job and the perfect this and the perfect that. Don't you think that. that we started at pressure on young people? Oh, because, well, so no, then, oh, this is where we go, right? right now what? But this is real. Like, the yeah. pressure on young people is exactly why um, I'm doing the work that I'm doing. Uh, I'm chair of the Committee on Children, yeah. uh, and a lot of the legislation that I've passed over the past four years has really been focused on that pressure that children feel because it comes out in many different ways right and so mm -hmm. mental health for children has been really my um, number one issue as chair of the children's committee uh, and and those pressures certainly play a big role one of my big focus issues going into the campaign health care as part of that is yeah. mental health recognizing that mental health is a medical condition and requires medical attention and and it 
you wouldn't look at somebody with asthma and say, oh, just breathe. Right, right, <laughs> so right. We need to rethink the way we treat mental illness, and we need to find a way to get resources available on a community basis. And I agree with you. However, I think what we've found is that most of the resources in the state of Connecticut were um, at the community level um, and that the ability to get uh, private doctors, you know, um, those with commercial insurance has really been the problem. And if you and your family are somehow involved in the system, chances are you knew where to find help for your child and you knew what services were available. Right. If you did not have a child that was accessing that system in some fashion, whether it be through Husky, um, whether you yourself had Medicaid, you, you weren't aware of the things that were available. There are quite a few communities around the state of Connecticut that have school-based health systems um, located in their school districts, which means that there was something on site at a school. That's not everywhere. So that would be the in the system that I'm including, right? right. Now we're expanding those to include mental health. Um, but additionally, if you were just a mom who noticed something was up with your kid and you went to the pediatrician, Chances are you're getting a list of three doctors that they've worked with written on the back of an envelope with their phone numbers handed to you and say, call me if you, if you can't get an appointment. But you can't get an appointment. For and months so, and months. months. And so we really work to change that. Uh, this year, we did pass the most comprehensive mental health legislation ever done in the state of Connecticut. Sandy Hook had a lot, a lot of really great things that set it in motion. Um, and our good friend, Representative Mashinsky, had a, a lot to do with that. And so we thank her so much for her work. Um, and we built off that this year uh, and, and were able to really make great, great strides. So much so that a lot of the work that we're doing now um, is going to be copied in other states. That's amazing. Yeah. Can I ask where the passion for this particular issue comes from? I, I've been really open about this um, at the legislature with my colleagues. It really hasn't been something I've been open about on a community level. Uh, but I have a child who um, is experiencing mental health-related concerns. I, I should say now, though, that we are beyond the acute stage, which... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I hope it stays that way. Um, but it was a process. It was a very big process. Um, and I did find myself to be that parent who got the list of names on the back of the envelope. And I was the mom calling around everywhere trying to get my child seen. Uh, and we couldn't find anyone. And you're somebody with resources. Right. Yeah. I knew how to navigate the system. And let's face it, I might be considered someone of privilege, because I, you know, I know these people who are running these healthcare systems because I work with them. Right. Still couldn't get it. First of all, it's good to hear that my child coming. is doing wonderfully, and I'm very, very proud of the work that was put in because yeah. it's a lot of work. And now you're paying it forward, so to speak. Absolutely, 100 percent through the yeah. bill. B zero five zero zero one five zero zero one. Yes, but there was a companion bill also in my committee, which was Senate Bill two, uh, and so these two bills really work together. Think of it this way: we're bringing in doctors, right? We're dangling carrots to get doctors from out of state here. We are providing funds for school districts to bring mental health professionals in. We are uh, making it easier uh, to get the help you need by expanding telehealth past its original date. We created a fund in order to um, help uh, the underinsured who have high out-of-pocket costs. You can apply to the state, have those out-of-pocket costs uh, so that you can get the help that you need right away. I'm proud of the whole bill. But <laughs> two things that, that I'll really bring forward right now. Um, we are creating urgent walk-in centers. Uh, for mental health around the state of Connecticut. That and, is so necessary. Yeah, it's really necessary. And those wheels were in motion uh, prior to this 
bill. However, what this bill does is now we're taking students, psychiatry and psychology students from our area schools. Look, we've got UConn, we've got Quinnipiac, we've got fantastic uh, schools. Yale, fantastic schools. And they will be coming into these DCF um, urgent care centers to um, work uh, with young people, right, um, and get their clinical hours that they need. Uh, in, in addition to that, studies show that where um, students do their clinical hours, they tend to put down roots in the community. So these are then doctors, uh, you know, when they graduate, these are doctors who will then um, stay here in the state of Connecticut. And then we've, we've also offered um, ways to help them stay in here, like uh, tuition reimbursement and such. But for all those parents who can't find a doctor, we are creating a pipeline of doctors who are going to live and stay in the state of Connecticut. Because isn't that one of the, the biggest concerns is you have um, mental health crises being dealt with uh, at an emergency room yeah. and, and you have a, a short stay and are sent away, whether you're an adult or a child, with maybe some medication and kind of left. A couple of things there. What you said is absolutely right. First of all, um, I was in Connecticut Children's um, as a mom, and um, there was no room available. And That's myself scary. and my child and my husband were there. There were a, at least a dozen kids waiting in the hallway. Oh, that's so scary. There's no place scary. to put them, right? Fortunately, my child could come home that day. They were not as acute, but there were a lot of kids there whose parents weren't with them because it was an extremely long wait. Maybe they were one income families, that person had to go to work, right? And so there was just so much happening right now. We heard consistently, you need more beds. We need beds in the short term, and I recognize that, especially when I was there. And so the bill does allow for um, more beds to be put forth immediately in two different ways. I won't get really into the weeds, but we make it easier for existing places to just add beds. Uh, and then we give um, in SB2, there's funding to actually um, build an area with more beds. With that said, if we just focused on early detection of mental illness, we wouldn't need more beds. So this bill was very, very strong on helping kids before they're acute enough where they're suicidal, where they're self-harming. That's transformative. Absolutely. We say this about men our, uh, medical care broadly. If we focus on preventative care and we focus on uh, allowing people to see the doctor, whatever the specialist may be, before it becomes acute, then we can prevent a lot of Let these prevent that. problems. And it's actually cheaper. Yeah. It can actually it's, be it's cheaper, much, much cheaper because it's more expensive to pay for acute care and chronic conditions <laughs> that have developed as a result of lack of preventative treatment. But let's put this also into perspective. Let's say I have... I have been, um, I've been feeling dizzy and I've been feeling faint, but I put it off for a while. It's getting worse. Uh, and then I pass out during work. I'm rushed to the hospital. They diagnose me with something. They put me on medication. I'm on the path to recovery. There's no recovery from suicide. The finality associated with suicide, we have to get those kids before they reach that point. It's not that we're putting it off and putting it off mm -hmm. because it's expensive, but when you get there, it might cost more money in order to fix the problem, but at least we can do it. It's children. It's children's lives. Yeah. The legislation that I have written over the past four years, I've written numerous pieces of legislation focused on, on youth and adolescent suicide. And we've been working on prevention for the longest time. And I think that this latest bill, which was the biggest, it was our, um, it was really the priority of the entire legislature. That's a, a lot of pressure. <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> but myself and um, my co-authors, we all came at this from the perspective of having a child who was navigating the system at its most broken point. And so that is why this bill is as good as it is. It really is. And, and interestingly enough, and I think it's important 
for people to know this. When we pass the legislation, you know, we do this all on TV, and then the cameras shut off. Um, and as I'm walking away, I have never had such a hard time getting out of that chamber, frankly, to go to the ladies' room, with, because everyone was coming up to me saying, my cousin, my uncle, my nephew, my child, my child's best friend. It touched so many people. Uh, and, and the more we talk about that, the more we can reduce the stigma associated with mental health, when we're not going to be in as, as big a crisis as we have found ourselves in the past few years. Did this bill start before COVID? I've been writing this bill in my head for the past three years. COVID then only amplified. COVID amplified the problem of the youth mental health mm. crisis to begin with. Uh, but before COVID, I mean, it was, I was still a crisis. It was still a crisis. Still. It was absolutely still a crisis. You, you could shine a light on it now. And I think a lot of it is, is that these kids were now home. So parents see it. Uh, that was kind of a wake up call. When you are in schools, right? You send your child someplace for six, seven hours a day, and uh, those people who are spending that time with your child notice things, and we see most referrals to mental health care come from within the school district. When schools were closed, there weren't those referrals, um, and parents didn't know what they were seeing, or we understood that things have changed so abruptly and we expected there to be some issues associated with that with our kids. But I don't think COVID created this. I know for a fact masks didn't create this as much as some people like to say. Um, I think what happened was the light was shining here and now it was shining at home. It was shining at our dinner tables or more accurately, it was shining in the kids' bedrooms because when you have a child with depression, you really can't get them out of bed. So, yeah. so you start to see these changes and, and parents didn't know where to turn and they started going to their pediatrician's offices. Pediatricians weren't set up to deal with it. This bill provides training for um, mental health awareness and, and um, early detection and treatment of um, youth and adolescents um, for every single pediatrician in the state of Connecticut for free should they want that. It passed unanimously in both chambers. However, Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Uh, wow, thank you. That, yeah, that was, it was huge. But that doesn't mean that it wasn't work. We needed to talk about it. And there were things that um, were important to me that I felt needed to be in the legislation that some people didn't understand. And, and I didn't get everything I wanted in that legislation either. I really wanted to be able to fund more studies regarding um, ketamine mm. uh, for treatment-resistant depression in youth. Um, I couldn't get people on board with that. So um, I still have more work in that regard. However, we did pass something in public health. That's not for adolescents. It took a lot of explaining why this was important. We purposefully convened a bipartisan working group in order to um, take on this legislation. And we had a really great working group. I think that I've learned, and I, and I hope I'm not giving away the farm here, but I think I've learned that when you go in, uh, you ask for 100 to 200 percent more than you want because you know you have to negotiate it down anyways. The bill um, passed at 100 pages or so. Uh, I think my first asks were somewhere around 150, 175 pages worth of asks. So you had luck working across the aisle Absolutely, with Republicans yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. getting this accomplished? Absolutely. And it, it, it was, was really, really great. great. You know, my ranking member uh, on the Children's Committee is one of the most outspoken um, anti-vaccine, anti-mask legislators that we have in the state of Connecticut. You know, you can't shy away from it. You know, I adore her personally, but ideologically we're very different. There was a lot of talk behind the scenes and uh, during the committee process, um, but ultimately uh, she supported the bill. I and I don't think she was going to support the bill when I brought it out on the floor, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I think that's something that is so important for people to hear, that there are Democrats, Republicans working together in the legislature for the benefit of the constituents, Absolutely. of the people. Because I think there's a real perception that, especially given 
uh, some of the, the nastiness, a lot of the nastiness that's developed in the last five, six years on the national level, people think that the Democrats and the Republicans just aren't working together. Yet yeah, that's not the case here. It's really important to me that I'm completely honest with everybody. It doesn't mean everybody is always backslapping and high-fiving and hugging it out. Um, you know, <laughs> there are some certain ideological differences um, between the most extreme parts of the party. Um, I am a member of the moderate caucus. Um, and my role in the moderate caucus often has been negotiating uh, with both sides. That's not something that I, I scream from the rooftops, but a lot of times it has been my job to take a bill that may have been too far left and bring it more center, or take a bill that was really too far right and bring it more center. Uh, and so that's where my skill set lies. Isn't that one of the, the great things about legislature and the way our legislature is set up, the fact that we have different ideological groups, different mindsets, different backgrounds, different experiences coming together to try to figure out how to make this all work. Absolutely. Um, there are still some members of these inner caucuses who are unwilling uh, but I think the vast majority of us want to work together. Yeah. And I think that's uh, the situation in every every workplace, every Absolutely. environment. There's, Look, there's you get 160-something always... people around, you're not going to all sing kumbaya at every moment, right? right? But ultimately, when you want to do the work for the people, yes. you get it done. And that's who you need in office. You need representatives who are willing to do the work for the people, because yeah. that's the name, right? The, the name is representative. And we're in the people's house. <laughs> it's not Liz making laws. Right. It's, right, right, right. It's, I, I, I think I appreciate when politicians will say, I believe certain things, I have certain standpoints, but I know that I represent everybody, not right. just the people who voted for me. Right. Right. But the people who didn't vote for me, the people who hate me, so, I still represent them. I'm so excited uh, for the opportunity to uh, work with you. And it's going to be fun, and it's going to be great, and you're going to be great. And I really, really, really can't wait to help people and to, to make the world better for my son. And I, you know, we're talking so much about children, and that's what I keep saying to people. I am a mother who wants to make the world a better place for her child. So and what you're telling me? Nothing stops that. Is you are just like all the people watching you right now. You're just louder, and you're going to fight harder, right? I, I certainly am. I can't wait to have you in there with me. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation, you're and I'm sure we'll keep going. Yep. But we are running out of time. I want to thank everyone for watching Groundwork with me, Rebecca Highland. I am running for state representative of the 90th district, and I hope to see you at the polls on November 8th. And I want to thank Liz Linehan, our guest, uh, for being here and sharing her wisdom with us. Thank you. Thank you.